And good afternoon, everybody. Hi, I'm Tina Brock, your host for Into the Absurd. So glad that you've joined us today. And if you're coming in on Facebook Live, welcome to you as well. Here we are at the Idiopathic Ridiculopathy Consortium meeting with you every Saturday at 5 p.m. We encourage your, your conversation and your questions in the chat if you're with us on Zoom today. We'll do our very best to get to your questions as we have a conversation with Gabrielle Corsaro, who is the Artistic Director of Angel Pirate Productions, and she is also a co-founding producer of The Bridge PHL. And I just want to let you all know that um, if podcasts are your thing, Into the Absurd can now be found on your favorite podcasting platform, so look for it there. As we fill in episodes, there's about 30 up there now from back in June when we launched. And we're going to be here with you on Saturdays at 5 p.m. So if you're not on the IRC's mailing list, we encourage you to head on over and sign up uh, for that. And look for us here Saturdays at 5 p.m. Gabrielle Corsaro, as we said before, she is the artistic director of Angel Pirate Productions and also a, a co-founder of The Bridge PHL, which is bringing voices and communities together here in Philadelphia. And I am very interested to talk to her about all the ways in which she thinks about healing, connection, community, and uses theater to do that. So Gabrielle Corsaro, welcome to Into the Absurd. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Gabrielle. Hey there. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I've been really looking forward to this. Yeah, well, let's, there's so much to dig into, but I think a, a good place to start to get just a little bit of a bearing and background on your life is um, you went to Temple, right? Graduated yeah. is, from Temple. Yes, I did. I did. Yeah. I graduated from Temple with a communications degree. Um, I did, I took one acting class. Uh, and then the week after graduating, um, I moved to New York City which was inevitable. Um, and, uh, and I was there for not, uh, not a year yet when I, I realized that I had to, um, I had to sort of confront the fact that I had always wanted to seriously pursue acting and I just hadn't, um, mm -hmm. out of fear really. Yeah. Um, when you say so, inevitable, yeah. your move to New York city, why yeah. was that inevitable? Um, well, my parents, um, I, I grew up here in Philadelphia. Uh, originally, um, when I was young, we were in South Coast Philadelphia, and then we moved to Center City. And I spent a lot of my, you know, the rest of my childhood and teen years in, in Center City, Philadelphia. Um, my parents were lovers of the arts, and uh, we took lots of trips to New York City throughout my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I was just enamored. I was just enamored with the city. Uh, I mean, I lived in a city, you know, but but um, and and I loved Philadelphia, but but New York really kind of blew my little self away. Um, <laughs> when and, you say enamored, um, I, I get get logistically. Do you, what was it? Just the energy of it, the bigness of yes. it, the possibility, all those things. Yeah, it was. Well, you know, part of it was also, I mean, because of my parents' love of the arts, I mean, my father was, when I was a kid, he was in graduate school at Temple for film production. And um, and he, the films that he made, he would frequently put me in them. And uh, and he, um, he, yeah. And and so, and, and there are, uh, so this is, I'll just give you a taste because, and friends of mine who know my father and a bunch of them do because he was an educator for decades here in Philadelphia and a bunch of my friends like had him as a teacher, they know Dom. They know Dom Corsero. And, um, so, and so this is, this is not surprising for him, but in a, in a, one of my, the first moments of my memories of, of acting as a child was when my father said to me, we were, shooting, we were shooting in City Hall Courtyard here in Philadelphia. And he said to me, okay, Gabby, I need you to walk through that archway and burst into tears. Can you do that? And <laughs> I was like, um, <laughs> that's the next step up from being put into the film. You're actually yeah. <laughs> asked to turn a backflip. As yeah, well. right. Exactly. I, you know, I was just like, I don't know why you think I can do this, but, but I'm going to, 
yes, yes, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, and what I ended up doing in that moment was just out of necessity, like, because I was a kid, I really, I wanted to get home. I wanted to have my Saturday back. I wanted to be with my friends, you know. Um, so I knew the sooner I gave my director and my father what he wanted, I could get back to my life. Um, and uh, and I ended up improvising on the moment, something that is similar similar to what I later studied is my Meisner training in New York City um, uh, to to just suggest something, you know, to yourself, something evocative, provocative, and, and let that the emotional mm -hmm. reaction to that build up inside of you, and then to just live truthfully um, mm -hmm. in the moment with your environment, with others, you know, and, and that's what I did. And I, I shocked everyone by being able to pull it off, inc including myself, not that acting is crying, but you know, it certainly came out of it just came out. And, uh, and he, my father ran up to me and he said, okay, that was great. Could you do it again? And I was like, I think so, you know, and so we did it again. <laughs> we did it like three times, you know, and when we were done and that scene was over, my mother rushed to me and she's like, are you okay, Tom? What are you doing to her? You know, and, uh, and I, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay. I just, you know, and I kind of explained to them what I did and what I thought of to make it happen. Um, but that was the bug. And they asked me then if I was interested in acting and I, I, I was torn. You know, I was torn because I already understood that there was a responsibility to to acting, to be to be honest, you know, to reflect humanity back to itself, as I was saying earlier to you. And and um, so I was very daunted by that whole idea of of actually pursuing it. Um, but I would still, I would find, so I said, no, no, of course not. No, I mean, I, you know, you got to wear winter clothes in the summer and summer clothes in the winter and I have to take off my nail polish because of continuity. And this is all like the, the waiting around is endless, you know, um, but, uh, but I would find myself as I was in like the Temple University bookstore with my dad while he's getting books for his classes, I'd be sort of like, you know, slinking over to the theater section and looking at the books and maybe making a couple selections and, you know, my dad would buy those books for me. And I just kind of vicariously learned about acting and theater and, you know, for, through that, through just reading about it for a while. Um, it was like my, it was like my side, my secret side, like romantic novel thing was acting. Yeah. So why do you think it was a, <clears throat> a secret? I have two questions there. Why do you think it was a secret side? It was a secret you know, of keeping from myself. Right, right. You know, you've talked a little bit about, or you, you wrote me about sort of this complicated relationship you've had all your life since childhood with, with art, with art, being an artistic person. And I, I, your story, you know, leads to that or suggests that. So I guess, how did you come to terms with, with that secret side? I think it, I, you know what? Very much like the work that I ended up doing uh, as Angel Pirate and with and 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 the Bridge PHL, um, I think that there are some things that, um, fortunately, just don't leave you alone. Mm -hmm. um, it's not so secret, right? <laughs> it's not. It's you know, it's a horrible. I mean, you know, it was a horribly kept secret. I had acting <laughs> books all over my room. You know, it was, and 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 I. And I would be, I was taken to go see theater, you know, in Philadelphia and in New York, and I did not pay attention to the plots. I was absolutely in love with the actors. I was watching them do what they were doing. And I was trying to figure out how they did it. And like, I was, I would just could watch them work all day um, without being even old enough sometimes to understand what was actually happening in the play. I was watching them work. And um, I had such a regard for that because I knew it was hard and I knew it was terrifying. Um, and I knew I wanted to be able to do it, but. Mm. Do you think, was there anything locked up in the fact that your dad was an early, <laughs> an early uh, talent agent for you in that <laughs> regard? I mean, uh, did, did you, did you feel duly responsible when you were creating that film or, you know, creating the crying scene in city hall uh, to, yeah. to, to be, to be a good, performer and a good, I mean, did that carry along with you? I, I mean, I, yes, I think absolutely. I mean, the fear of not, of honestly, of just not being good, you know, of, and, and, and in acting, not being good is so closely tied to just not being honest, hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, 
the like I said, like the, the, the burden and the responsibility and the accountability of acting. It, it's, you know, it's really personal, like we owe it. Yeah, I feel like, you know, like we owe our, you know, those we're working with, of course, the playwright and the director and everyone that we're acting with, but certainly everyone who's come to watch us, that we're doing this honestly, you know, um, that we're portraying a truth that we have taken the time to uncover and to present to them. You know, it's, I mean, you know, I put a lot on it, Tina, I put a lot on it and, uh, you know. Um, well, but I mean, if you were, pick any other profession, you you would hopefully be doing the same thing. It's just you're, you're managing the tools of emotion and that's, yes. that's, that's, that's the vessel. I mean, the body that, yeah. is. That's the what, vessel. Exactly. What happens to you when you are, on stage or when you're in a role or working and and you can viscerally feel like you're not there you're not you're not honest is do you are you right. a, is do you have a harsh critic mm. oh yeah but um i mean yes i absolutely have a, a a harsh critic to myself um i like to be very prepared um i like to be very very prepared i really really hate to be not and my mm -hmm. idea of being prepared is definitely some other people's idea of being way too prepared but um but it, like not way too prepared that's not but i have over, over studying yeah isn't that yeah. interesting how everybody has a different range of what they need to do to yeah feel, feel secure in yeah. in, in yeah. that bobsled that they're getting ready to get into and it's we and and i feel like if i am prepared then i mean I did study, you know, and I and I do have technique and I know how to grab onto that and just trust and let myself, you know, be in the moment and go forward in what it is that I have to do, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, without preparation, that's really scary. And then the business of acting obviously is so very different than all of that, right? And that right. was my um when I when I got to New York and I found myself um after not having, you know, I did take an, an acting class at Temple, but I told myself it was because I wanted to understand my actors and, you know, when I, if I directed people, you know, which you know, you're you like, know I'm like, Ooh, <laughs> zoning make that choice. <laughs> hmm. okay. But, um, so, but I did, you know, in New York, found myself on the Upper West Side in the drama bookshop and like, you know, picking up a book called the Professional Acting Training in New York City. And uh, that was um, a life changing purpose because that's where, that's the book where I found um, Joanna Bexon, who is the, the acting teacher who um, absolutely made me an actor. She's still an acting teacher. She's brilliant. Um, that class, um, I felt free. You know, I felt um, like I had, that, that it was time, that it was time for me to let this happen to me, to like, take the jump. Um, yeah. You felt kind of free from your, that, sort of secret self that wouldn't ever sort of own up to what do you think it was about the owning up part of it was it was it and you may have answered it and uh, before in in that you do every you really wanted to be really good at it and you weren't sure you could be honest enough do you think that was part of it i think i knew that it was really hard and i was scared of it um it's so obvious when we're not successful at it and I'm not, super, mm, mm -hmm. I struggle with having compassion for myself. And frankly, I struggle with compassion in general. Um, I don't like to admit that, but it certainly starts with not like I, I, I'm better with compassion, but I'm, I definitely struggle with being competitive and, and it starts being competitive with myself. And one of the things that was really difficult about pursuing acting in New York City is we're looking to work all kinds of stuff, right? Commercials, mm -hmm. film, student film, you know, corporate films, like, like, like do all kinds of, you know, you're just pursuing all kinds of auditions and, and putting yourself into so many different situations, or at least that's, that's, the, that's the way I approached it. And, um, and you just never know what you're walking into, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you never know who you're walking into, what you're walking into, what the dynamic here. Frankly, if you even really want to be a part of this that's happening right here, mm -hmm. we don't know. We have sides. We don't have the full script. The lack of power there was really disorienting because, you know, um, because I needed, I felt like I really needed to be able to have a strong hold on 
acting technique and truthfulness to what I wanted to say and who I wanted to be. I mean, there's nothing to hide behind. We, we are, as you've said, the vessel, right? It's our body, our face, our voice, you know, and if, if we do a lousy job, nobody forgets it, you know? Um, so yeah, so that was, it was really, really difficult to pursue um, acting work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and have that experience as and com compared with the 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 safety and the the home of of uh, of an acting studio with teachers and and students that were being so brave, you know, and so truthful. And yeah, that was an incredible experience. But um, yeah. when you said you felt free back in your class that you found, and and I'm assuming you know you're equating that with being able to be really honest about it. What do you think was the 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 thing the I'm I'm losing the it, word right now the catalyst it, there? Well, certainly, I mean, I mean, I have to say, you know, certainly Joanna Bexon, you know, the teacher, she's I, she changed my life, uh, and we are still dear friends, and so certainly she created the environment where that could happen. And she kept the bar very, very high, but but she was compassionate, but it was very, but she, but with tough love. And for some reason, there was just something about the way that she was. And and Meisner technique turned out to be like obviously the thing that sort of came to me, you know, as an epiphany uh, in City Hall Courtyard. You, you um, taught but, yourself but Meisner. <laughs> I said it was like on the, you know on the fly, but it was, it was the one that turned out to make sense to me. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. You know that yeah. I could feel like this is my connection. You know, everybody everybody works differently. You know, there's a hundred different ways that you can go about this, and certainly there were other things that I other tools and stuff that I picked up as I went along. But that was that was the basis, um, and so it was it was it felt free. I think because. Well, I think that this is a big part. There was permission to mess up as long as, as long as you were really trying, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, not hiding behind the... Right, not making excuses, not mm -hmm. indicating, not trying, you know, like, like the, you, if, if, if we were present in our work and being honest and there was no reason in the environment that Joanna was creating that we, that we couldn't access that, mm -hmm. as long as we were bringing full self, you know, and we mm -hmm. were taking this really seriously, not overly seriously, but like we were taking, we were there and present with it, then, then good stuff was going to happen there. Mm -hmm. And I'm always be very, very grateful for, for those, for those days in those classes. Yeah. Do you think that you pull um, experiences from those early classes uh, in setting that environment in the work that you do um, when you're when you're directing and or when you're working with folks either in Angel Pirate or in the Bridge, you know, do you, do you consciously go back to yeah using technique not yeah. personally so much as we're going to create an environment in which people feel yeah yes I mean I certainly hope that others feel that I do um, but I I yes I feel like. Um, with the work that I do with Angel Pirates, so if I've written something and there are other actors like acting it and I'm directing or perhaps, you know, someone else is directing, I just, I feel, I do feel um, that it's very, very important that, that the actors and, and whoever else is involved feels welcome, wanted, appreciated, uh, uh, needed, valued, and, and, and free to try stuff. Just try stuff, and because I'm not, I'm not going to be able to say exactly what's going to work and what's not going to work. Obviously, that's the beauty of it, right? That's the beauty of rehearsal is you never know what's going to come up, and um, it's you know that 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 preparation thing that I love. Well, that's rehearsal too, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah, yeah, that was that's that that's I think it's. I think we all know, certainly, you know, as, as performers, when you're in an environment where you feel like you can safely take risks, and by safely, I just mean like, you know, there's not someone hanging over you ready to criticize you, then you're going to do some of your best work. Mm -hmm. 
we were talking earlier, so I, I, I will we'll move the timeline on a little bit and then I'll add this question from before. So we're coming out of New York, you come back to Philadelphia and back in 2005 start Angel, uh, Angel Pirate, uh, right? Um, yes. And I guess the question of one of the things we talked about was the sense of the self. How do you hold on to the self and or in, in this artistic journey and find what the self needs to say as an artist and as a person who decides to say start a theater company yeah. that that complicated decision of of what's my special purpose <laughs> you know how right. did that come right. to you when you returned to philly excellent question i mean i think uh so i was someone who would um in in New York, walk into casting directors' offices, talent agents' offices when we're getting to know each other, and the question would be, you know, what what, what are you interested in doing? And I would say things like, and I feel naive now sometimes when I think about this, but I would say, you know, I want to be part of the solution. You know, I want to help. I want to, you know, I would say things like that. No, it's not what they were looking for me to say. It turns out. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, and, and, but, and what I would get in response was some version of, well, Gabrielle, you know, I believe that you want to do that. And so I would suggest you go make your own work, which is not what I wanted to hear. You know, I wanted to hear like, you know, oh, you know, but yes, I mean, I wanted to hear, oh, social justice, that's second door on the right, and racism down the hall, you know, like, I mean, well, I didn't know the word anti-racism at that point, but, but, um, but, you know, I was, that's what I was uh, looking for. Aren't you by delivering a, a well-crafted character, helping somebody's production somewhere? I mean, on I some mean, level, it's a very, absolutely. it's, it's, it's an answer that we all want here. Right? I want to help your show. I want to help your, well, your movie. Absolutely. I want to help your, you know, yes. but I, but I hear what you're saying, right? That that's not exactly what they're you're trying right. to, you know, you're trying to get they're work. You're trying to build that <laughs> resume. You're kind of, come on, Tina, you know, we're trying to like, you know, and it's, I mean, look, and I will say that, that, um, you know, and we will we will get to all of this, but I mean, I I see it now actually as I was in a system that I'm not that I'm absolutely complicit in of you know uh, capitalism and patriarchy and white supremacy. I mean, this was like there was a business, you know, and and in America and that had a patriarchal history and a white supremacist history, you know, as Bill Hooks called the imperialist capitalist uh, white supremacist patriarchy. And that's, that, is, that is the environment that we're all living in, that we've all inherited. And if it had been a different system, right? If there had been, to jump to some of what I, you know, we'll, we'll, we will be getting to is, is, you know, if there had been, if we had been a nation that, and a society that was honestly reckoning with its um, history and in a process of healing and in, in, on a journey of, of reparations. And if, if, if this is who our, I mean, I know I kind of like, whoo, left turn, but, but like, you know, if that's who, where we really were as a society, then um, I imagine that there would be certainly more black and brown people throughout all intersectionalities, involved in all layers of society, certainly in, in leadership. And, you know, someone like me walking in and saying, you know, I want to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. There might have been a different answer to that. I might not have had to make my own work. I might have eventually. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, instead of feeling that what I was getting back was like sort of bewilderment and be amusement and God bless them because I don't know, you know, obviously that did not sound like I was going to make any one of us any kind of money, but, um, but you know, that's, so anyway, so in coming back to the reason to make Angel Pirate, I, I you know, got back to, to Philadelphia, became a mom and a wife and, um, and uh, knew that more and more that I didn't want to spend a lot of time pursuing acting work that was gonna take me away from my daughter and my family, unless it really, really meant something. It was really important and that it was tethered to what I felt my purpose was, um, which I hadn't quite honed in on yet. And, uh, but in the meantime, I was doing a lot of work with um, green light arts, green light production. So uh, Alex Del Pandola's mm -hmm. uh, uh, production company, and she has since moved with her family to LA, but she was in Philadelphia at the time. 
and there were annual festivals of one acts that she put on and that's when I started writing and directing um, with with that with that group and met so many uh, wonderful theater artists in Philadelphia and um, that that I you know work with now. Um, I just remember you all over at Denise Shubin's place. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, really really that was grassroots and very important work in the development of Philadelphia small theater. I, it felt exciting, you know, it felt, uh, it felt um, filled with possibility and again, it felt safe. So mm -hmm. I started figuring out what I wanted to write and it was the first time Alex came to me one day and was like, I'd want you to direct my new piece. And I'm like, I don't, I've never directed anything except for like a scene in a class. And she was like, but you can do it. And, you know, I mean, moments like that, are just so generous and are such an, you know, an open door um, that that we walk through and, and never, you know, and then that's, we walk through to the rest of our lives in some major ways, just this one opportunity to do something new. Um, so, so, that, so, so that's how I started uh, creating, you know, Angel Pirate, and Angel Pirate comes from my name, Gabrielle Corsaro, Gabrielle from Gabriel, the Angel of Mercy, and Corsaro was, Corsaro, Corsair is a word for pirate in Italian. Um, and so angel pirate, I had in my mind as, so who is this? So who is this angel pirate? And it seemed to me like it was someone who was out to do good, uh, but was not asking for permission. And, um, you know, was, was, was sort of armed with a will and a determination, um, but like, you know, but like with, with joy. Um, and so that's that's where the name came from. Um, and yeah, I started writing things that were, some of them were political. Uh, some of them were sort of more kind of uh, discovery things. Some of it was social justice. There was a lot of, there was trying a lot of different things. Um, and and Greenlight Arts was a, was, a, was a great place for me to try that stuff out, um, so. And did that then grow your initial um, connection with this idea that you might have discovered in New York when you answered the question in a way that didn't get didn't get you a green light? Um, did did that strengthen then your idea that and and be the beginning of the of the honing of that purpose, which has led to where you are today? Has yeah, it changed? I think Mm, yes, I mean, so I was empowered because I had my own company and I was empowered because I had figured out how to write a one act just that I could that I could just hear a voice in my head. Maybe it was mine. Maybe it was someone else. And I could write a piece, you know, and that it could be funny if I wanted it to be or that it could be not, you know, or, or you know, I, I could do whatever I wanted um, that and that that was that was a wonderful feeling. Um, and and I think though that I was still trying to figure out what I was, what what really I had to offer and to say, um, and uh, several things happened. Um, in in two thousand and eight, my mom became ill, and we my husband and daughter and I we moved into my parents' house to help them, and she passed on New Year's Day in two thousand and ten. Um, I went. Through a period of um, really anger and 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 um, and struggle, they're kind of just reflecting on on her life and uh, how to spend one's life. And then in 2012, Trayvon Martin was killed, and I think that that is something that it sickened a lot of us. You know, it it uh, it sickened not not just in a, like a moral, like that's so horrible way, but like I started to really begin to feel some of the things that had been hitting me on the head for decades. Um, I started to feel a sickness around me that I was in the middle of something that was a sickness and that we were asking ourselves and certainly most cruelly, you know, black folks 
but we're asking all of us to just move on. You know, horrible thing happened, just move on. And then, um, but it just kept happening. You know, my, my father was grieving and it, two, uh, 2014, he passed. Um, I mean, Eric Garner died in 2014, uh, Michael Brown. And it stopped me in my tracks. Um, it, it stopped me in my tracks because I thought, how do I continue going on and writing anything that I might've been writing before when, when I know about all this now? When I, when I can, when I, when this is what's present with me, how do I write about this? You know, I'm, I'm a white lady. How do I, how do I, how do I write about this? And, um, and, and moments would came back to me from different points in my life. Like I remember being on set of a, um, of a, uh, of a, a shoot for Vibe magazine, which is no longer with us, but is a, 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 like an R and B hip hop magazine. And um, I was shooting on set. I had my my uh, my set mate, my my buddy that I'd made, this lovely young black woman. And we were, you know, we just sort of really clicked on the set. And a conversation went up uh, uh, in our little talent holding area about O.J. Simpson and the and the case, and um, and you know, lots of lots of talk going on there. And and she turned to me and she said, well, I know this. If it had been a black one, woman, no one would have cared. And I was so grateful that she said it to me. Um, I was changed in that moment. And I, I would like to say that I said to her, I know you are right and that is so messed up. And what I had in that moment was, I think you may be right about that. And that's the best that I had to give her at that moment. Um, but I knew- but you that knew she, she was right. Right. Unequivocal. I knew she right. was right and it was hideous. Um, so that, so I had moments like that, that had happened, that would happen, I imagine it happens to many of us. Mm -hmm. And And, but in these, but in the context of like all of this, uh, this brutality on, you know, and this disregard and uh, lack of value of black life um, happening in our country. This, I, it all just came back to me, like flashing back to me. Like we've been yelling at you for a long time, Gabby, and you still don't know what you want to do. You don't know what you want to say, you know? Um, and I felt it, felt it really viscerally, but I knew that I had to know more before I could actually say anything. Uh, um, and it was right around this time then, 2014, 2015, when, when, um, when Merlin Brown and Hannah Sabatoris McLeod and we all started gathering and putting this collective together and talking about that we wanted to confront racism, that that's what we were going to be about. And, um, and, and, uh, and Merle said, okay, so we want to confront racism, but, but what, what more, there's got to be more than that she said it has to be about that healing connection and that's you know that's where we we got our our mission to foster healing connections between diverse communities um encouraging openness and dialogue on racial prejudice privilege inclusion intersectionality and bias through powerful acts of theater and we mean it um you know uh it, it uh, for my own work i had to seek out anti-racism work. I had to, I had to go find out more about white supremacy and white privilege and, um, and the myth of colorblindness and how, you know, colorblindness means that we're also blind to whiteness. And so we don't see ourselves, you know, as it, it, we, we don't see, white folks don't see, uh, I didn't see my role in all of this and that so much of my role in it was staying silent mm -hmm. was not saying not yeah. responding not changing even though you know i mean if a if a martian dropped down on the united states and was trying to look around and figure out what was happening here and they looked at our prisons and they looked at our schools and they looked at our neighborhoods and they looked at our organizations and they looked at where the money is 
and they look at where the money definitely is not. Um, there is um, there is a, a, a sickening feeling um, for me when I when I realize that uh, I was walking around not knowing what I wanted to say, and there were literally frequently black women walking up and like practically smacking me on the head uh, with something I could help with. And uh, and when I say help, I mean I want to. Um, I want to, you know, definitely name check like uh, white saviorism and optical allyship. Um, I, these are things I live in fear of. They are worthy of my living in fear of them uh, because they're that bad. Um, uh, optical allyship, of course, is when we're doing things, we're saying we're speaking out against racism, but we're not actually doing the work behind it to figure mm -hmm. out how we are complicit in it. And, and, and white saviorism, you know, is actually like things like giving voice to the voiceless. And I want to, you know, they're not voiceless. They're pressed, you know, they're, they're, they're <laughs> disregarded, you know, and, 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 and so what, what I realized was that in, in my work of supporting uh, any kind of anti-racist mission, um, we had to just create a space for as many black and brown artists that wanted to come and work with us. And they could write without whatever they wanted, whatever you know, and and uh, and that the the white artists that that would white artists that would come to work with us somehow what they're doing has to fit in our mission, um, of course. So, but but really just to create the space, promote the work, and get out of their way, help them whatever way we can, whatever way we're asked to. But um, but otherwise, just you know quit creating obstacles. Mm -hmm. That's the first step is to, to take the obstacles away. Yeah. Is what you're saying. Um, I, I mean, the first is to create the space, hold the space. The space right? yeah. And make opportunity. Yeah. And, and then obstacles. Yes. I'm, I'm interested in um, um, encouraging creative commotion uh, was, mm. is, is one of the, the phrases, I think. Yeah. Um, rightly so associated with uh, Angel Pirate, is it? Um, yes. Um, do you think it's possible to, to are, does creating commotion and healing occur in, are they good bedfellows or do they need to occur at different times in different places? And is each one welcome in the other's home? Mm -hmm. Wow. Those are that's sort of really a large question, but uh, I do think about that a lot. I mean, yes, <laughs> I, I, yes, I think so. It's going to be different, right? It's going to be really messy. Um, I think that 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 the commotion. Uh, it it sounds. I'm in. You know, I'm embarrassed to to even say it, but for for uh, you know, it's a commotion to betray whiteness. It's a commotion to speak out and and say you know, I will show the book, you know, me and white supremacy, but you know, Layla Afsad, she wrote it for, um, for white liberal folks. And uh, to say, you know, you need to wake up. Um, you, you say, like in my, you say you love us, that you're some, that you're, you, you cherish it, you have us in your family, you certainly are friends. We need you to do more than that. You know, we need you to do a lot more than that. And it, it starts with you looking at yourself, um, and so the the com so there you have commotion, right? Mm -hmm. That is very unsettling. The commotion begins within yourself, right? It, there's no way to know where it's going to lead you, um, and so be it because this is this is the necessary path. Um, mm -hmm. So so and then it's interesting how just being in that commotion. Right, and and then being in in the in in the honest, uh, fallible, we're gonna mess up. I'm gonna say it. Like I said, it's not the it's not if or when you're gonna say or do the wrong thing. The when it has been and done. It happened. It happened a million times. There is no nice white liberal person who hasn't done and said racist things in front of their black friends and family members. It happens all the time. We just don't necessarily always know it, that that's what we're doing. 
um, and do it when we want to. Uh, Anti-racism work helps us suss that out. And so while we're in commotion and in the work, that is bridge building. Mm -hmm. Within that yourself. Is, and, and within yourself, certainly. And then it's also a gesture towards understanding how to stop being an obstacle, mm -hmm. how to stop you know, limiting the, the, the work and the freedom and the safety of black and brown folks, because our silence does that. You know, our, our, um, our uh, um, well, we call them microaggressions, but there's nothing micro about them. They are painful and unjust and, uh, and we're gonna keep doing it. We're that's the thing, you know, uh, it's gonna keep happening. But at least through the excavation of anti-racism work, we can know when we, we we can know when we see ourselves doing it sometimes, or if it needs to be pointed out to us, if someone calls us out, calls us in, we're ready to hear it. Mm. It's not gonna feel good. We might push back, but 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 we're in a place of being able to hear it better where we won't become defensive. We can take it in and apologize and then and then move forward so that maybe, maybe, maybe we can be the last era of liberal white folks who are not really helping. I mean, en masse, not really helping, right? There's always gonna be the activists, but like we have a massive power to do more and to actually literally change the world. And like I said to you in the thing I wrote to you is that clearly as of January 6th, we all can see that white supremacy is coming for all of us, right? Of course, it, you know, certainly for black and brown people, Muslim people, Jewish people, right? But in the end, it's coming for all of us. And um, we see that there's really no excuse. So um, it's, I am, Obviously now I'm really, really in my, you know, I'm in the place of the thing that I feel like I need to say um, mm -hmm. so much, but that the bridge building begins with unsettling yourself as a white person and risking kind of everything um, and just trusting that it's the right move. The doing that work, that the unsettling part is actually you're uncovering a, a wound that's pretty pretty deep. Did, what, what was the most unsettling thing you've discovered about yourself that you yeah. wouldn't have previously? Yeah, that's a really good question. There have to. been a lot. There have been many. Um, I, I will say that, you know, uh, in doing the work, a lot of times we can as white liberal folks, we can say, well, I would, I've never said that. I've never done that, right? That's racist, I'd never do that. I would never do that, right? And, but the realization that the question is also, um, but have you thought it? Was it, like a, was it like a subconscious, unconscious reaction to something or someone? Did you bring, you know, white baggage, you know, two things that you didn't realize did you gaslight and say that's not what i meant you know that's not what i meant well yeah that's really that is is violent um uh and i think that the other thing that the thing that is hardest is the realization of, of having stayed silent for, for so long um like i said there's evidence you know, of it, and especially it, it, I saw, you know, a lover of so many, like, you know, Dominique Morisot, Susan Laurie Parks, like, like the, you know, it, it's, they, could they be any clearer, you know, and, and I didn't, I kept making art about whatever I was making art about. Not that I think that that's the answer. Not everyone has to turn around and start, you know, making art that's specifically about like a white woman's struggle with her, with, you know, with her inner, inner racism. Um, that's just what I do, but um, right now. But uh, but I think that um, that uh, that there there has been, uh, of course, this outrage at white people from Black and Brown folks when we say, certainly after the uprising and protests of last year after George Floyd, Floyd's death, and there was this 
outpouring of, of white feeling of, I didn't know, I didn't realize. And that's, I'm sure, true for some, but for most of us, we knew. We knew. And uh, where did we put that? How did, and, and, and how did we let um, ourselves not reckon with this? And um, so, and I think that many times we did, we thought we did, we were voting and we were speaking out and, you know, but for, for a lot of us, you know, we don't do, don't do a lot of activism, don't do a lot of marching, don't do a, um, a lot of introspection on our races. Race, race, you know, I say this a lot to people now. I'm like, you know, Karen, a Karen is not a noun, it's a verb. We all, all white women can access that, right? There's, it's, it's, it's available to all of us. And, um, and it's right, it's right there. Now it might not come out in that, you know, we actually do something as hideous as, as the, the, the Karens that we see out here doing things. Um, but we're doing other things that are uh, completely irresponsible and, and painful. Um, and we wouldn't if we had taken time to work on ourselves more and to understand that, you know, okay, we're white because we come from European ancestors, but they weren't white. They, they were whatever they were, right? In my case, mostly Italian American, right? And they came here and they on the census then were white. And the value of that, because what does that mean? It means you're not black. And so you have a card now, you have a, you have a, a membership card. Uh, our, our ancestors all struggled. Our white ancestors all struggled and had to persevere. And 100%, this is not about, there wasn't pain, there wasn't struggle, there wasn't oppression, there wasn't. But they came here and they became white. And that effect, that moment, we are, we are living in the aftermath of that. And it won't change unless we change it. I want to just approach the topic of vague gesture. Yeah. yeah. Because I'm, as you're speaking and, and I'm thinking a lot about the healing internally that we all have to do to get to a place where it's not an empty, vague gesture, but a deeply felt and necessary change that becomes more, that becomes who we are, as opposed to the vague, the vague gesture. Yeah. Um, and how, how along the way we can You know, the vague gesture may be, well, I, I, I don't know how to formulate the question to say that there's going to be stages, right? There's the healing internally of it and sort of the work and being, absolutely. I guess, compassionate to ourselves as yes, the first absolutely. place, not in a cuddling sense, but just mm -hmm. like, all right, you know. This is hard. Do you catch your, I mean, is mm -hmm. it a question of, There's about five questions that I'm going to ask. But let's yeah. go back to the vague gesture. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's the one I, I mean, I, so so I would say that for in my experience of of doing this work, you know, and I am I am charged by the the black and brown anti racism educators that I study with now and that I follow um, to go and get my people, as they say, right, to bring this to other white folks that we know are able to hear it, um, and to bring them into anti-racism work. And the, um, in the same way that we teach ourselves to do anything and then can figure out how to apply it in a real way to our lives, that's this work. As we learn, we can reflect on that, sit with it, and we will have little epiphanies about our own selves and our own lives, past, present. Um, and we'll see ways that we can make changes. Um, I know, you know, not everyone, uh, you know, uh, well, what a great you know, platform, a couple of different theater companies that can approach it. Not everybody has that, but we 
can all, sometimes it's, uh, a lot of times it starts with having what we say, like courageous conversations, you know, they're like difficult conversations, figuring out how to talk to other white people about this, you know, um, and, and how to make that, let that make change um, in, 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 in everything that we're doing, just let it change everything. Uh, in some way, but it's of course it's going to be gradual. In fact, please let it be gradual, because the last thing in the world we want to do is do more harm while we think we're doing good, right? That's going to happen anyway. We we are going to mess up. Um, but but the but so so in the same way that we would thoughtfully go about studying and preparing to do anything that we knew was important, you know, for ourselves, and but most certainly that was going to impact other people take the time to do that work, you know, read books, have, you know, study. We have on the Bridge PHL's anti-racism page, we have, you know, anti-racism educators uh, that, that, you know, are available. You can get materials online. I'm sure lots of people are doing this. I'm just saying for those of us who don't know about this, there's a wealth of, instead of, you know, going to your black friends and saying, what can I do? You know, which you should not do. Um, you, you can, you can, there are loads of black and brown folks who for decades, if not centuries, have been talking to us about this and, um, and are telling us things that we could do. Uh, but also things about ourselves that we need to internalize and not push away and just say, how do I, how do I do that? So when I see a Karen, right? Or when I see something else uh, that I am like, ooh, bad black person, right? I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but I say, you know, bad, bad white person, bad white person, right? How, I have to say to myself, but how do I do that? In what way do I do something that's like that, like what they're doing? What do I feel? And it's hard because sometimes it's the, the, the line is not clear, but, um, but the, the potential to do harm is always available. And uh, it's learning about that. And I guess, you know, getting to a place where, as you spoke to before, you can really have an open conversation about anything because the change is not going to stick or have meaning or fire up deeper healing inside of yourself. And it seems like, you know, we're in a, in a place now, fortunately, where hopefully more attention just politically, um, we're in a, a different sort of a different landscape now, which is really helpful. Um, but it also highlights the deep division that yes. was there prior so all the more reason why um it's on all of us to as you say not be silent i mean that's that's kind of the first thing you can always i think say to yourself is when should i have spoken up in that moment when it was really just not going to go well but needed to happen yeah i mean it, yeah. There's, there's, um, there's so many opportunities to make little changes um, and to um, uh, certainly uh, there's a lot of it is, is the excavation inside yourself and, 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 and in that you are, it, it is laid out for you plainly that, um, that there have been many moments when you could have made a different choice. Uh, and that, that, and for me, sometimes it's, it's just the realization that in that moment, when I said that thing that, that was taken like that, but that's not how I meant it. It doesn't, the, 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 the impact is greater, is, is more important than, than the intent, right? That's, that's one of the main, you know, tenets of, of anti-racism work is knowing that your, your intent does not matter if the impact was harmful, right? And so my, my realization that I would have, that I did things and said things that had a ne negative impact on a person of color. And my reaction was, but I didn't mean that. I realize now that my responsibility 
abilities to understand that we are all in context here. We are in the context of our history, um, of this country and of the world, but certainly of, of, of this country. And um, that, that white folks don't have to generally deal with that context, um, but black and brown folks deal with it with their very lives. Um, and so it is on us the burden to understand that we have a shared history that we just we just need to unlearn and relearn our history so that we can be behaving in some in a context that relates to the context that black and brown folks we have forced them to live with going on inside of them at all times. Um, that's some of the stuff that's that that I that that I carry around with. Me. And then also just that that doing the work um, at some point, you know, a lot of it is not just the self excavation, but then like, you know, please watch when they see us on Netflix, watch 13th, you know, read, read um, the new Jim Crow, read, um, you know, uh, there's, there's, there's even podcasts uh, are, are important because you, you hear the voices of black and brown folks explaining their, their, their experience of any number of different uh, moments and uh, in their lives. And it is so helpful to carry those voices, I will say inside of me. And so what happened was that there was um, a moment of, of, uh, of a new kind of heartbreak, a new kind, of, something that broke open inside of me at some point when I realized, and this was right around when we started to put together the Bridge PHL, when I re realized that I could go no further as I was before. You know, in the name of every black and brown person I have ever cared about and many that I hold very, very dear and, but also all of them that I will never know and never meet. And it doesn't make any bit of difference if I can't stand up in this moment and say, we have to, we have a whole lot of change in, to make happen, you know? Mm -hmm. That was a little soapboxy, but it was, I oh, mean no, it. Not at all. I mean, I think the journey of, I'm thinking of you running to city hall and crying repeatedly and repeating it over and over and over again. And then how that, <laughs> how that theme in a way comes back later on in your life, running to city hall, crying, the heartbreak, <laughs> your heart breaking open and realizing yeah. that that's what you're doing. Yeah, coming back to Philadelphia. Coming and, back to yeah. Philly and, and really finding, yeah. and I, you know, finding that that's the voice, that's where you needed to put the voice and that's where you feel most powerful. And that's clear by the work that you're doing and how you're serving both Angel Pirate and also the Bridge, the Bridge PHL. And, um, there's so much more to say on this, um, Gabrielle. I would love to to uh, have you have you come back and and talk more about the work that you're doing in the, in the in the year to come. And we'll make sure that um, we'll post this along with the links for Angel Pirate and uh, the Bridge Page, so everybody can check out the work that Gabrielle's doing, and uh, both virtual and when we get back on the stage again. Thanks so much for enlightening us all and for being a voice. Thank you, Tina. Thank you for the voice. opportunity. I, uh, I really, I, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation and to reconnect with you, certainly. And um, yeah, this is, this was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. And thanks to all of you who were here with us today. I hope that you'll think about joining us next Saturday, same time, same place here. Next week, we're going to be thinking about the role of absurdism on the theater now that we're in a little bit of a different place and what that means. And we're going to call some of our favorite folks to the table to have that conversation. John Zach, Jane Moore, Sonia Robeson, Tomas Dura, who have appeared in productions, uh, Eugenia Inesco's The Bald Soprano, The Chairs. And we're going to talk about what it's like to work on that work during very surreal times and what absurdism might mean 
as we make a return back out onto the stage, what vestiges will be there for us? What would the UNESCO have thought of this time, Beckett and all of those? It'll be a conversation. We'd love to have your questions and your participation in when we see you this time next Saturday at 5 p.m. Join us. Thanks very much for everything you do to keep all of this going and wishing you a very safe and a very healthy week ahead.